lifetime at least. And uh, will we'll have huge ramifications, however it is decided. I first want to say OCO and, uh, and thank you uh, to the Cherokee Nation, uh, particularly um, Secretary of State uh, Tyna Glory Jordan. And I believe that um, Chuck Hoskins is on, on the line and maybe uh, Chief uh, Chuck Hoskins Jr. So thank you for, for hosting this. I think this is a, a really incredible uh, uh, series of, of CLD presentations and it's a great service to the, the Bar Association to, to provide this information and this forum to, to keep abreast of, of current developments. Particularly in this age of uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, learning how to use Zoom. I've, I didn't know how to use Zoom until about uh, six weeks ago. So um, I've been learning fast. Um, the Sugar. I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. Um, the, the first thing I want to say is uh, Crow and Dunleavy is, is a firm of about 120 lawyers and we represent a number of companies and, and tribes and so forth. So what I have to say today are my personal views and not necessarily those of Crow and Dunleavy, other attorneys or uh, our tribal or corporate clients. Um, let me uh, divide uh, this presentation into several parts. The uh, first part that I wanted to um, talk about are the two cases. And that is um, the current case that's before the Supreme Court, McGirt versus Oklahoma. And the original case uh, that the Supreme Court accepted certiorari on in 2018, uh, Patrick Wayne Murphy uh, versus uh, Royal, uh, which um, became Carpenter versus Murphy, who was an interim warden uh, when it was argued before the Supreme Court. And then uh, currently it's called Sharp versus Murphy. Um, Patrick Dwayne Murphy uh, uh, committed a, a heinous murder in uh, rural McIntosh County near Henrietta back in August of 1999. He was tried and convicted for the murder of uh, George Jacobs in uh, later that, that year. And then in early uh, 2000, he was uh, sentenced to death by an Oklahoma jury. Uh, throughout throughout his uh, his time, uh, Mr. Murphy has consistently challenged the jurisdiction of Oklahoma over his murder, claiming that the murder happened on Indian country. Now that his theory has changed a little bit uh, during that that time period, and he has had a number of appeals to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, and also several federal habeas corpus appeals uh, in the eastern eastern district of Oklahoma. And after two successive habeas petitions, uh, Judge White uh, ruled against all of his positions. The first was uh, he claimed that Indian country jurisdiction existed because there was a one-eighth mineral interest on the allotment where the, the murder uh, alleged to have, to have occurred. Um, but later, um, his next position was uh, that, in fact, the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation uh, from the, tra the Treaty of 1866 um, had never been disestablished by Congress by specific language. And that because the reservation was still intact and because he was an Indian or is a, is a Creek citizen and, and Mr. Um, Jacobs, uh, the decedent, was, is also a Creek Indian, that the Major Crimes Act applied. The Major Crimes Act gives exclusive federal jurisdiction uh, to, to federal courts for major crimes, and the, the tribe also has concurrent jurisdiction as well, but the, the penalties are more limited. And because of that, the state of Oklahoma would not have jurisdiction. And that's the, the crux of, of Mr. Murphy's um, uh, appeals and uh, collateral challenges through habeas corpus. Eventually, um, I, I believe Judge White certified one of the issues, and that was the jurisdictional issue. And it went up to the Tenth Circuit on several iterations. Uh, during that time, uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch served on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and later was elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court uh, several years ago. The U.S. Supreme Court, as I mentioned, accepted certiorari, and 
they uh, had briefing and oral arguments took place on November 27th of 2018. And it was a very uh, interesting oral argument. Lisa Blatt uh, from Arnold and Porter represented Oklahoma and did the, the oral argument. Lisa Blatt is a, is a very accomplished Supreme Court advocate. She, uh, at the last count that I saw about a year ago, uh, she's had 35 cases before the US Supreme Court and has won 33 out of those 35 cases. She uh, knows her way around the, uh, the Supreme Court and is the procedure wall. She did have some pretty testy interactions with uh, the Supreme Court justices, particularly with Justice Sotomayor and uh, Justice uh, Kagan. Uh, there were lots of testy exchanges early on in the argument uh, between those, those two, uh, with them talking over each other and uh, also with uh, uh, Ms. Blatt disagreeing that she had to answer certain questions, um, particularly about when did she claim that uh, Congress specifically disestablished uh, the reservation. So there were a lot of fireworks in the argument and the article that I've, I've sent to Kendall uh, Bird and is now posted on the uh, Supreme Court website for Cherokee Nation there's an article that was published just about six weeks ago in the Federal Lawyer, and there's a little bit more detail about that interaction and some more detail uh, about the case. The, the article is called, uh, Has the Earth Shattered Under Oklahoma? And it talks about implications uh, for the um, uh, Murphy versus Royal case, Murphy versus uh, Carpenter, and uh, also McGirt. I wrote the article back in uh, October and submitted it in November. And then the US Supreme Court granted certiorari in the McGirt case uh, just about a month later. So I, I had to write several postscripts several times uh, before the article was ultimately uh, published. Um, and then of course we had the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, global pandemic arise, which uh, really threw things into topsy-turvy uh, uh, for the world. Uh, one thing I, I did want to reflect back on was the Murphy versus Royal argument in the Tenth Circuit. I attended that oral argument, and uh, Jennifer Crabb is an assistant attorney general for the state of Oklahoma, and she argued on behalf of uh, Oklahoma in that case. Patty Palmer Gezi, uh, the federal public defender who's representing uh, Mr. Murphy and who I think may be joining us today, uh, also argued for uh, Mr. Murphy in that case. Uh, there were several amici uh, that uh, also argued. Uh, I was the attorney general representative for the Seminole Nation and the Seminole Nation and Muscogee Creek Nation filed a friend of the court brief uh, prepared by Kanji and Katzen a law firm who has continued to represent the Muscogee Creek Nation as amici in the Supreme Court. But during that argument, uh, one of the judges, I believe it was Judge Matheson, asked uh, Assistant Attorney General Crabb, point to us where Congress disestablished the Muscogee Creek Nation Reservation. And she hem and hawed and ultimately said, I, I can't point to any specific language that disestablished the reservation. And at that point, I knew that uh, things were not looking good for the state's position and that uh, Mr. Murphy and, and the tribal interests had a, a good shot at things. Ultimately, Matheson, who's a former um, U.S. attorney from Utah, uh, wrote the opinion for the three-judge panel, and it was 123 pages. It's quite a tome. Um, but ultimately, they relied upon Solom versus Bartlett, a 1984 U.S. Supreme Court decision about disestablishment, and the following case, Nebraska versus Parker, which is a 2016 U.S. Supreme Court case about disestablishment. Those two cases are the benchmark that the Tenth Circuit faithfully applied. Oklahoma asked for reconsideration, and the Tenth Circuit in bonk, meaning all the active sitting judges, decided that they would not rehear the case and Judge, Chief Judge Tempkovich wrote a uh, concurrence to that denial of, denial of in-bank consideration where he said 
that there were no new issues, that the Tenth Circuit faithfully applied uh, the Sutherland versus Bartlett and, and Parker versus Nebraska test, but that the, but this was a case that screamed out for the Supreme Court uh, to grant certiorari and take a look at it, um, given the, the stakes that were involved. Of course, I'm paraphrasing uh, what he said in, in his um, concurrence. Mr. Um, McBride, this is Trish Archer. I apologize. I don't want to interrupt, but I did forget to ask or explain the CLE requirement. If you uh, could give, if everyone, Ms. Mr. McBride is going to give us two separate words uh, through this presentation. And if you can take down those two words, please, and then email me those two words at Trisha, T R I S H A, at archer law.com. Or if you want to CC Kendall Berg, the Cherokee Nation, um, we can then get your credit for your CLEs. And so I promise that will be my last interruption, Mr. McBride. I apologize for that. No worries. Uh, thank you, Trish. I, I, I meant to make mention of that. Um, and in fact, uh, since we're close to uh, 15 minutes in, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you your first code word. So everybody write this down and, and send it, but you're, there'll be a, a second one later. The code word is sovereignty. Sovereignty is the code word to get your CLE credit. Okay, so the Supreme Court um, took the case. Uh, Oklahoma took it very seriously. And as I mentioned, they hired Lisa Blatt, one of the top uh, advocates. She's been involved in some Indian law cases before, including one uh, against uh, Cherokee Nation interests. It was the, the baby girl uh, adopt versus adoptive couple um, case. And she, she represented Oklahoma on that one uh, successfully. Um, Oklahoma entered into an agreement. Um, and I read some press reports. Uh, a reporter did some open records requests to Oklahoma and found out that Oklahoma had paid her and her firm, Arnold and Porter, uh, half a million dollars uh, for services, basically on discounted flat fees. And the, the press report said that the, the value of the services were about $1.3 million. So that, that's some pretty big time uh, resources for the, the state of Oklahoma you know, to, to fight the case. Um, the oral argument was, was very interesting. It was split up um, four ways. Uh, first, um, in Gershengorn, uh, represented Mr. Murphy's interests and argued very eloquently uh, for his interests at, at the Supreme Court. Next, uh, Mrs. Blatt, Ms. Blatt, uh, argued on behalf of Oklahoma's interest. And then uh, uh, Ed Needler, who is Assistant uh, Solicitor General and one of the deans of uh, Indian law jurisprudence in terms of arguing the position of the United States, argued as a friend of the court um, by invitation from the Supreme Court uh, of the United States interests. Finally, uh, Riaz Kanji on behalf of Kanji and Katzen uh, argued on behalf of the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, as, a, as a friend of the court. The arguments were, were, were very interesting and uh, one uh, interesting detail I wanted to give you was a personal experience that I had in going to the court that day. Um, I went through security, uh, the U.S. Marshals were there, the, the uh, United States Supreme Court uh, Marshal Service, and I was stopped and they wouldn't let me in initially because uh, I had my Muscogee Creek, I'm sorry, the uh, Seminole Nation uh, lapel pin uh, on. And they, they quizzed me, what is that? Uh, why are you wearing this? And ultimately, the, the marshal made me take it off before they would let me into the courtroom. Um, and I think that they have a policy um, about you know, political uh, emblems uh, in the courtroom. And so uh, I dutifully took it off. Uh, I'm a member of the Supreme Court Bar, so you, you sit really close to the justices. It's, it's literally only about 10 or 15 feet away from all the justices on the, their long bench of, of nine justices sitting there. So I could understand that uh, there could be something, but I was a little bit taken aback that a, 
a tiny lapel pin uh, would make that much difference uh, at the court. And I, I'm wondering if they if they made uh, U.S. attorneys or or others uh, take their lapel pins off. Also during the same term, uh, I believe it was in the Washington Culberts case, uh, one of the tribal leaders uh, had his traditional uh, headdress that he tried to enter the courtroom with. And the marshals uh, stopped him and wouldn't allow him to wear his headdress into the courtroom. Probably on, on the same grounds. Ultimately, he was so taken aback by, by that uh, restriction that he refused to go in. Um, but that was just a little uh, side issue about Supreme Court procedure I, I did want to share. Um, the, the case was pending for quite some time, uh, just about five or six days after their argument on November 27th, I believe is Jan uh, December 5th, the Supreme Court sent out a rare um, request for additional briefing in Murphy, basically focusing on whether certain criminal laws conferred by Congress would apply on the reservation regardless of whether there was a reservation or not. And so the, the parties responded uh, to that briefing uh, shortly thereafter before Christmas. It sat there, languished, there was no word. Everybody was waiting on bated breath uh, for the end of the term in uh, last year, 2019. And uh, uh, in May, nothing came. Uh, early June, nothing came. And ultimately, uh, the last day of the term, which was, I believe it was uh, June 27th, uh, Chief Justice Roberts announced uh, the last remaining cases. And he announced that uh, Murphy versus, uh, or Carpenter versus Murphy would be re-argued. And that was a, a really rare uh, uh, decision. And it, it hasn't happened very many times that I'm aware of. I've only seen it happen maybe five or six times in the modern era. And uh, several of those cases, um, which were so monumental, um, included uh, Roe versus Wade uh, back in the 19, early 1970s. The, the major abortion case was set for re-argument. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education in the late 1950s, um, the racial desegregation uh, busing case and uh, Citizens United um, about campaign finance uh, was another one. So it, it's, a, it's a very monumental and, and rare situation. There was a lot of speculation during the summertime thereafter about why the Supreme Court set it down for re-argument. And the consensus that everybody um, has speculated and, and come to is that Justice Gorsuch recused himself from the case and that there must have been a four to four split. And that um, by custom, if there's a four to four split, the decision below will stand. And there's been several Indian law cases, major Indian law cases uh, where that's been the case. The, um, I believe it was the Washington Culberts case that I mentioned uh, months earlier was one of those cases that, that split four to four. Therefore, the Ninth Circuit uh, decision stood uh, affirming that uh, Washington had to uh, respect the treaty rights of the tribes regarding uh, salmon uh, fishing and, and breeding. And uh, uh, a lot more groceries than I thought. They were about 15 minutes late. I've been processing the groceries. So um, uh, another case where that happened was uh, three terms ago in the Mississippi Choctaw versus Dollar General case. That was a four to four decision split. And that one happened uh, because um, one of the justices, uh, Scalia, passed away um, after oral argument and wasn't replaced in time. So um, that one stood for the, the uh, I believe it was the, the Fifth Circuit, um, affirming that the Mississippi, Mississippi Choctaw had a, a tribal court had jurisdiction over non-Indian on a consensual relationship basis. So that was a rare deal. And since then, there's been no re-argument in Carpenter versus Murphy. And instead, uh, in uh, early December of 2019, the Supreme Court accepted certiorari on Jim C. McGirt versus Oklahoma. It's basically
Mike, excuse me, Mike, somehow you got muted. I'm sorry, could somebody let me know where, where I got muted? It, it wasn't long, about 10 seconds ago. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not sure why that happened. I'm not. Um, okay, I was just talking about Jim C. McGirt case, and uh, he was uh, convicted of a sexual molestation of a, of a four-year-old over in Broken Arrow and uh, convicted in state court, and he's been serving, times at the, serving time at the James Crabtree uh, Correctional Facility. He, uh, like many other uh, inmates in the wake of the Murphy case, uh, Murphy versus Royal from the Tenth Circuit, um, filed a, a petition to, to challenge his uh, conviction. And the Supreme Court took that one. They uh, passed it to conference about five or six times before they ultimately granted certiorari. And uh, that is the case uh, that's currently pending. In Gershon Gorn, again, who uh, represented Mr. Murphy is representing uh, Mr. McGirt and argued the, the case before the Supreme Court. Uh, this time, uh, Mr. Uh, the Solicitor General for Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Mithin uh, Masanjani, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, argued uh, the state's position. And uh, also uh, Ed Needler, the Assistant Solicitor General for Oklahoma, who's argued about 100 Indian law cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, argued, and also um, Riyaz Kanji, again, on behalf of Ms. Koyukui Nation. They split time, and uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting argument. Uh, it lasted over an hour and a half, and uh, they gave them extra time to uh, make the arguments. And uh, they were, you know, very interested in uh, a number of points and really focused heavily on the Nebraska versus Parker case that I mentioned earlier. I'd like to uh, shift time uh, just real briefly to um, one of the big issues uh, in the case, and that's Indian country. Indian country is a uh, legal term of art that goes all the way back to 1790 when uh, Congress first mentioned it in one of the early statutes. Uh, Indians are, of course, mentioned in the Constitution uh, three times, so a lot of cases go up to the Supreme Court based upon that. But uh, Indian country wasn't defined in that first statute. It got its first definition in about 1833 or so. Uh, and during that era, um, Congress really referenced uh, Aboriginal title and occupancy of, of Indian tribes, uh, having land or a land base uh, to live upon, and that, that was Indian country. And frequently, it was the western part of the United States where uh, tribes existed and had not been uh, uh, removed through treaties or otherwise. Uh, shortly after that, there, of course, there was the removal time period and, and uh, uh, President Jackson and the harsh trail of tears forcible removal um, and the anguish for the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, uh, Seminole Nation, uh, and Chickasaws uh, being forcibly removed Oklahoma. And there were a, a series of treaties thereafter. And the important treaties were uh, the ones that happened right after the Civil War. Uh, a number of the uh, tribes, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, aligned themselves with the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War. And uh, there were even some battles fought here in Oklahoma, even uh, near the Tulsa area uh, involved in the Civil War. And as punishment for siding with the Confederacy, um, the United States forced uh, some additional treaties that had some uh, pretty draconian uh, provisions in there um, that dealt with a lot of issues. But also, um, it, it ended up giving more, giving up more land. But the provisions uh, in those treaties are at issue in McGirt and in, in Murphy, and specifically, uh, it, it deals with uh, whether uh, the reservation has been disestablished or not. And the treaties don't use any magic language of, of cession or uh, giving up the, the land base specifically. 
so um, there, there was really a, a lot of focus on uh, that treaty language and any subsequent treatment by, by Congress. Of course, there was a continued westward expansion and railroads coming through Indian Territory and uh, through the western part of the United States, which hastened uh, a white settlement and white pressure on uh, Indian country um, to uh, give up the lands. And there was a lot of uh, clamoring in Congress, a lot of executive branch uh, pressure, particularly under uh, Teddy Roosevelt um, at that time. And uh, there were a number of laws passed and the Dawes Commission was set up in the early uh, 1890s. And they were set with the mission to break up the tribal land mass, break up the, uh, try to break up the reservations and allot the land. And the Dawes Commission went and tried to uh, strike a deal with the Muscogee Creek Nation to give up the reservation, but was unsuccessful. Ultimately, they did reach an agreement on allotment, but the uh, cessation uh, of the reservation never practically occurred. And there's back and forth in Congress about that, and there were subsequent laws. Ultimately, there were um, laws passed for the Oklahoma Enabling Act, and statehood, which happened in uh, 1907, uh, which was um, the uh, uh, 48th state, if I recall correctly, uh, of the Union. Uh, in the materials uh, that's posted to the website, I've, I've put some maps that are um, helpful. This one is uh, the one from uh, 1890 uh, through 1907, which shows the eastern half of Oklahoma, the, the Cherokee Nation in orange, the Creek Nation in yellow, uh, the Choctaw Nation in green, the Chickasaw Nation in red, and then the Seminole Nation here in green again, uh, which is still co coextensive with uh, Seminole County. Uh, those are the treaty boundaries of the, of the 1866 uh, treaties and, and basically where uh, the reservations would be. That's about 46% of Oklahoma right now, and about 19 million acres. The Creek Nation Reservation that's at issue here is about 3 million acres. This total population area, uh, Indian and non-Indian alike, is approximately 1.8 million people. So it's not an insignificant issue of, of sovereignty for the five tribes or for Oklahoma. And uh, there are a lot of really uh, important issues there. Um, the next thing that I want to mention, mention about Indian country is uh, a number of cases early in the early 1900s uh, following the statehood of Oklahoma. Uh, there were a number of federal cases and they generally arose in the um, federal criminal jurisdiction arena under the Major Crimes Act, whether the federal government had uh, jurisdiction instead of the state to prosecute major crimes. And there were cases such as uh, uh, United States versus Sandoval, uh, United States versus McGowan, uh, United States versus Pelican, and then one that arose in Oklahoma arising out of the Osage uh, murders in the 1920s, and that was United States versus Ramsey. And I believe that was a 1928 or so U.S. Supreme Court case that held that a uh, Osage allotment uh, constituted Indian country and therefore uh, the federal courts had jurisdiction to, to try uh, murders of uh, the infamous uh, reign of terror uh, within the Osage nation. Uh, all those cases deal with different aspects of uh, what is Indian country, uh, be it an allotment, a dependent Indian community, uh, whether um, the tribe held the uh, the land in fee as a fee patent, but it was separately set aside by the United States under federal superintendents, or if it was trust land. And uh, all those cases um, came up with holdings. In about 1948, Congress uh, took the holdings in those cases and created uh, the Indian Country Statute uh, that's fam familiar to us all, and that's 18 United States Code Section 1151. And 1151 uh, basically codifies those cases uh, in the federal criminal law, and that's used as the benchmark for federal criminal jurisdiction. 
but it's also had a, a very important uh, civil jurisdiction component uh, that uh, tribes and, and federal courts apply for the extent of the civil jurisdiction of Indian tribes and, and tribal power. So tribal sovereignty still has a, a very strong land component and a nexus to, to land. And the cases kind of go uh, in that direction and, and try to um, align themselves uh, with land. So 1151 is still a, an important concept. And this case is adjudicating uh, uh, the reservation portion of 1151A and, uh, and what that means. Oklahoma, uh, throughout most of its history though, uh, Oklahoma officials, the executive branch and the legislature has had a pretty strong belief that um, Indian tribes uh, lost their reservations at, at statehood uh, in 1907. And they've expressed that belief like during the uh, termination era in the 1950s, uh, when uh, Congress passed the uh, Public Law 280, which gave states the, the right to, um, or the, the option to assume jurisdiction over Indian tribes if they took certain steps. Oklahoma responded back to Congress saying, we don't need to because uh, we don't believe Indian country exists any longer. Of course, there's been a lot of uh, tribal uh, and scholarly debate uh, about that position with Oklahoma since that time. Um, but, but it's been a, a very uh, a common belief um, since that time. So um, there have been a number of criminal cases in Oklahoma that have held that um, uh, the state had jurisdiction over crimes that took place on Indian country, including allotments and dependent Indian communities. Um, and finally, uh, the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals uh, reversed that, that many decades long line of cases uh, with a, a case called State versus Little Chief, which I believe was uh, 1978. In that case, uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals acknowledged a, a federal court ruling, I believe it was Judge Doherty in the Western District of Oklahoma, that held that um, the state didn't have jurisdiction over crime that, that happened on a, a, a tribal allotment. And that was an unpublished decision, but the Court of Criminal Appeals published Judge Doherty's um, decision in full in State versus Little Chief. Thereafter, that really spawned a, a resurgence and a renaissance in uh, tribal jurisdiction and, and tribal courts in particular. The Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, started to um, work unrestly on restoring courts of Indian offenses and helping establish courts around Indian country. The Sac and Fox Nation uh, established an early tribal uh, court at that time. The Cherokee Nation revitalized it, its court system and uh, a number of uh, tribes uh, undertook the CFR court provisions to, to use uh, the Bureau provided court services um, to adjudicate cases and, uh, and to exercise that, that aspect of sovereignty. There's a lot of um, really good literature out there um, uh, Browning Pipestem and Bill Rice wrote some really good articles uh, in the American Indian Law Review uh, shortly that, after that decision that I would commend to you. Um, Susan Work, uh, who is a, a former Attorney General, uh, a predecessor of mine at Seminole Nation, and uh, also at, at Creek Nation, and I believe she worked at Cherokee Nation, uh, has done some really great scholarship, and I commend this excellent book to you. Uh, that has a lot of the, the history of, of that. Um, there have been subsequent cases um, that have dealt with Indian country in the federal courts. Another one involving Cherokee Nation is United States versus Adair from 1997 uh, that dealt with uh, the uh, Rocky uh, area uh, of the Cherokee Nation and it, it dealt with whether a dependent Indian community uh, still existed. I thought the facts were pretty good in, in um, U.S. versus Adair uh, for there to be a, a uh, dependent Indian community, but um, the, uh, the judge disagreed and, and found that uh, it wasn't. A, uh, another case was uh, United States versus Hollis Roberts, the former chief of the Choctaw Nation that dealt with um, sexual harassment. And the United States prosecuted in that one. 
and that's an Indian country case too. Um, and there's a, a pretty good uh, uh, discussion and language of what constitutes Indian country in that case. And I believe that that was written by uh, Judge Seymour. And uh, she basically identified the, the consistent test of land uh, that is validly set apart by the United States government for the use and benefit of Indian people or Indian tribes um, that is under federal superintendence. And that, that is the, the Indian country uh, test. And I think that's important uh, to these cases that are, that are currently pending. Another case I wanted to mention is uh, Oklahoma Tax Commission versus Sac and Fox Nation that was decided in 1993 by the US Supreme Court. That was another uh, seminal case uh, involving uh, Oklahoma. And uh, the Supreme Court held that um, uh, Native Americans that work in Indian country and uh, reside in Indian country uh, don't, uh, are not subject to uh, the, the state taxes. And it also uh, had rulings regarding uh, tribal license plates and tribal powers to uh, regulate um, license plates. And, and that's the, the big license plate case um, that today has helped uh, reaffirm the right of tribes to, to have their own tribal registrations and tribal uh, license plates and tribal revenue in that regard. But one interesting uh, provision uh, that um, we find in uh, the Sac and Fox case is it, it references informal reservations. And uh, I'd never seen that, that term in, in cases before, but I think that, um, uh, the justices were um, a little perplexed by the Oklahoma situation and, uh, and recognized that there, that there were still reservations there, even if they were informal. So that language is, is, is still out there. Um, I think that's gonna be a, a very important case if, uh, if McGirt is reversed and if uh, Murphy is affirmed, that the Creek Nation still exists and that the other four of the five tribes uh, have reservations intact, that um, there are uh, a number of rights for taxation and regulation uh, by tribal governments within their reservation areas. Uh, Bill Rice, who I mentioned earlier, uh, my predecessor at, at Sac and Fox, uh, argued that case before the US Supreme Court with the able assistance of uh, Judge uh, Greg Bigler, um, also Assistant Attorney General at uh, Muscogee Creek Nation, I'm sorry, uh, Second Fox Nation, but currently a uh, chief judge at the Muscogee Creek Nation. And I want to give a shout out to um, a, another a webinar that will be um, broadcast uh, today at 1.30. You can go to Turtle Talk and uh, click on it. I believe it's by the National Tribal Judges Association. And it will also be di discussing uh, the Mer McGurk case from a historic and uh, uh, Supreme Court procedural perspective. Uh, Judge Bigler, um, Dean Stacy Leeds, or Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Stacy Leeds, uh, former uh, Cherokee Nation Supreme Court Justice, will be um, presenting as well as a uh, Riaz Kanji, um, the advocate for the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, at 1.30. And I believe that that's a one and a half hour CLE. So this is a, a great day to um, get some perspectives of, about this case. Um, moving on uh, to other portions of uh, what I wanted to talk about here, uh, the oral arguments, uh, as I mentioned, uh, were, were pretty interesting. And one distinction that Oklahoma wanted to make is, is a, position, a position that they flip-flopped on uh, from the Murphy case. In the Murphy case, they said, uh, the Creek Nation uh, reservation existed, but it was terminated by um, the statutes that enabled statehood and, and, uh, and diminished uh, the tribal sovereignty powers of the Muscogee Creek Nation government. But, but in the McGirt case, they pivoted and said a reservation never existed for the Muscogee Creek Nation, and instead said they, they bought a bunch of land and, and had a fee patent to it, and instead, it was a dependent Indian community. And their new theory, um, which they tried to um, base upon the Venati case, 
from the U.S. Supreme Court that involved uh, Alaska, Alaska Natives uh, that um, it was simply a dependent Indian community and, and therefore um, since the powers are degraded by Congress at statehood and, and thereafter, uh, the dependent Indian community uh, doesn't exist any longer. And uh, interestingly, the Un United States uh, disagreed with their position. Ed Needler, the, the Assistant Attorney General, argued that uh, the United States disagreed and, and said that um, they believed that the reservation existed for the Muscogee Creek Nation in both cases. But in both cases, the United States, as friend of the court, also said that they believed that the uh, reservation was diminished by virtue of uh, the statutes and, uh, and what had happened. So in uh, looking at all that, the uh, Supreme Court was really hyper-focused on uh, Selim versus Bartlett and uh, ne Nebraska versus Parker. And, and the tests that the Supreme Court uses to look at this establishment in those cases. And the Supreme Court opinion in Nebraska versus Parker says that first you start with the text of the statute and the text is the best guidance of what Congress intended. It's, it's a sort of a strict textualist interpretation and uh, the per curiam unanimous decision of the Supreme Court written by Justice Thomas in 2016 said that the uh, Congress never used specific language to cease uh, the uh, reservation uh, in uh, the Parker case. So they, they looked at the legislative history and they said that it was inconclusive that there was things said back and forth. They said that you could also look at the subsequent history, but they also said that that is, is not a clear guidance either, and that that's uh, one of the most minimal factors. Uh, to quote the uh, Supreme Court and Parker, they say, the framework we employ to determine whether an Indian reservation has been diminished is well settled. And then they um, cite the, the Sullivan versus a, a Bartlett case and, and the, the tests that they use there. And they look at all the, uh, all the language and, and the statutes thereafter and they say that um, it, it wasn't disestablished. They note um, in, in that case, which involves the Omaha tribe of Nebraska, formerly known as the Winnebago tribe, uh, that uh, their reservation was uh, diminished several times. But in 1882, on the, the last sale, um, there was no language whatsoever on diminishment of the, the reservation to, to cede the reservation. And that um, thereafter, the, the tribe didn't exercise any um, governmental um, authority over that area that was at issue in Pender, um, that they didn't have any cultural um, stomp dances or powwows or or other types of um, traditional events in that area, that they didn't provide any services in that area, and that less than 2% of the uh, population in that area was uh, Native American. But despite all that, the Supreme Court said it didn't matter, um, that subsequent history didn't matter there. Congress didn't clearly disestablish uh, the Omaha reservation in that case. And so the language is, is, is pretty clear. And uh, it's, uh, I think that if you just look at Solon versus Bartlett and Parker versus Nebraska, Nebraska versus Parker, it should be a slam dunk for the, the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation on this case, and Mr. McGur Mr. Murphy, that the reservation uh, boundaries have not been disestablished. But I can tell you that the Supreme Court seemed very concerned about the criminal law aspects of the cases and whether uh, a bunch of convicted felons may end up going free or escape justice by virtue of the reservation being uh, declared intact and uh, there being a flood of uh, 
cases that would go back to, to state court. One other um, thing I wanted to mention about statehood, uh, uh, in Oklahoma, um, as, as we saw from the map, um, there was a, a big chunk of it, you know, over 50% that was um, various portions that had been uh, allotted or uh, otherwise uh, been uh, ceded, the reservations no longer existed. Um, but there were other states that had that similar situation. For example, Arizona, upon its admission, I believe after Oklahoma uh, in 1908, if I recall correctly, 24% um, of uh, Arizona at that time was Indian reservation. South Dakota, upon its admission, was 47% uh, Indian reservation land. And Tennessee, uh, the state of Tennessee, up, upon its admission to the United States, to the Union, was 75% uh, uh, Indian country and Indian reservation. So I, I don't think that a lot of arguments that Oklahoma made um, you know, about the amount of Indian country uh, holds water uh, in that regard. Um, one quote from uh, Parker, uh, is they say that petitioners' concerns about upsetting the, quote, justifiable, justifiable expectations, end quote, of almost exclusively non-Indian settlers who live on the land are compelling, citing Rosebud Sioux. But these expectations alone, resulting from the tribe's failure to assert jurisdiction, cannot diminish reservation boundaries. Only Congress has the power to diminish a reservation, citing Dakota. And though petitioners wish that Congress would have, quote, spoken differently, we cannot remake history, end quote. So that's pretty strong language in, in Parker. And the Parker court finishes the case by saying, quote, because petitioners have raised only the single question of diminishment, we express no view about whether equitable considerations of latches and acquiescence may curtail the tribe's power to tax the retailers of Pender in light of the tribe's century long absence from the disputed lands. See, for example, City of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York, 2005. End quote. So Parker sort of leaves the specter that there could be other considerations such as latches um, that they, they might consider. And there seemed to be some discussion uh, about that, but the Muscogee Creek Nation case, the McGirt and Murphy case seemed to be on all fours with the, the Parker case and, and, and very similar um, on the, the types of issues that are, that are involved. I can tell you in watching Justice Thomas at the Murphy case uh, right across from me, he seemed, uh, he, of course, he didn't utter a single question uh, during that oral argument, but he seemed uh, pretty flummoxed uh, and, and, and pretty frustrated uh, during that argument. And I could see him uh, exhaling and had a sense of frustration, I think, uh, about the case. And remember that he wrote the Parker decision. Um, but at oral argument in the McGurk case, Justice Thomas seemed to be uh, uh, right out of the gate. He asked questions um, as they went down uh, in seniority uh, of asking questions. And he seemed to want to uh, limit uh, the holding in Parker by asking uh, or by suggesting that um, the Parker case dealt with surplus land. and and that this case is a much different case uh, from Parker, that the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, case is, is, is much different. So um, I really had a sense that, that Justice Thomas was looking for a way to distinguish or distance himself from the unanimous opinion in, uh, in Parker. Um, moving on to uh, some of the criminal law considerations. Uh, Oklahoma really made, in both cases, a quite a 
quite a, a, a big to do about a parade of horribles of what would happen if um, if the Supreme Court were to find the Muscogee Creek Nation the reservation intact. Uh, in particular, at the um, oral argument uh, in Murphy, um, in rebuttal, uh, Lisa Blatt said uh, that there were literally thousands of criminal cases that would be affected if the Supreme Court affirmed the Murphy decision, and that it would be plagued by insufficient evidence, uh, statute of limitations problems, stale evidence, unavailable or dead witnesses, and, and things of that effect and implied that uh, some of those uh, hardened criminals would uh, go free. And one of the quotes she said, quote, that's 155 murderers, 113 rapists, and over 200 felons who committed crimes against children, end quote. And then ticked off a, a, a parade of horribles um, about that. But, the briefing and the factual record doesn't really bear out um, the thousands of cases uh, that Ms. Blatt referenced. And Oklahoma seemed to back off uh, that argument um, in their briefing in the McGirt case. Um, Ed Needler, the Solicitor General, um, did reference that there would be um, a big burden on federal resources and, and tribal courts if the Supreme Court were to find the reservation intact. That there would be, need to be more FBI agents, uh, greater US attorney resources, additional resources for the federal courts in the Eastern and Northern districts of Oklahoma. Um, but frankly, I, I don't think that that's gonna be um, such a big deal. Um, Riaz Kanji uh, made pretty effective arguments in his uh, written briefs as well as an oral argument uh, that uh, there are cooperative agreements in place um, that can deal with uh, these law enforcement issues. And in, in fact, uh, quite a few cross deputization agreements exist between the Creek Nation Light Horse and uh, the Cherokee Nation Marshal Service or the, the Light Horse Police for the uh, Seminole Nation or the, the other nations that would be affected. The Creek Nation currently has uh, cross-deputization agreements in 40 out of the, the 44 uh, local government and county government uh, areas within its jurisdiction. So I think that, that life would uh, go on um, pretty normally for, for most non-Indians uh, in, in the jurisdiction. Um, one other thing is that um, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act from 1996, it was a law that Congress passed uh, in the wake of the Oklahoma City bombings and basically it was directed to Timothy McVeigh. Um, it amended uh, federal law to provide uh, limited habeas corpus relief. Uh, a convicted felon uh, in the state system uh, would only have one year uh, to appeal and to challenge a, uh, a conviction uh, and to seek relief, except under extremely limited circumstances such as actual innocence. And that um, anti-terrorism law, uh, which became law in 1996, knocks out a vast majority of uh, potential cases there are very few cases where um, the petitioners or the, the convicted uh, uh, felons have um, preserved their jurisdictional issue of, um, um, of that the, the, the tribe had jurisdiction instead of the state of Oklahoma. Now, under existing uh, Oklahoma law, uh, they can appeal to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals and there's also habeas relief there. Um, but they've been holding about 40 cases. I'm, I'm informed by uh, Patty Palmer Gezi, the uh, Assistant Federal Defender, awaiting the decision of Murphy and, and McGirt. And they've also kicked out a, a number of them on procedural grounds. There is also a latches a doctrine in Oklahoma, and it's possible that the State Court of Criminal Appeals could um, decide a number of those cases on latches. Uh, Rebecca Nagel, um, who is a Cherokee citizen, wrote a 
really um, wonderful article uh, less than a month ago that was published in, in the Atlantic um, about these criminal conviction numbers and the McGurk case. She really drilled down uh, in a very persuasive uh, fashion. It's, uh, here's the article, Oklahoma's uh, suspect agreement in front of the Supreme Court. And uh, she did open records request Oklahoma to, to really drill down on these, uh, these penitentiary records because the Attorney General's office was not being forthcoming with them and uh, the uh, Department of Corrections wasn't giving them up. So, and she also contacted Ms. Blatt who's, who referred her to current Oklahoma counsel. And uh, so her open records request uh, came back with uh, volumes and volumes of voluminous documents and computer data that took months to go through. And she plows through um, the cases and basically finds that um, there are 1,887 uh, potential cases that could be affected by this case, but that most of them, again, are knocked out by the anti-terrorism uh, habeas law and whittled down on a number of other grounds, in in including uh, the time served or the remaining time that's left on the sentence. Um, that it really wouldn't make sense to seek a uh, habeas petition or uh, seek a re renewed appeal on, on that basis because of the, the time remaining. And also uh, frequently, particularly for, for drug crimes, uh, the state sentences are much lighter than potential federal sentences. More often than not, federal sentences are much more harsh and more severe, and uh, it's a big gamble. Uh, the uh, it's a big gamble for uh, uh, convicts to, to try to do a habeas challenge uh, for that. So basically, um, and, and there's also been a case from the, the 10th Circuit called N. Ray Brown that applied to uh, Murphy um, and, and said that uh, Murphy was not a basis uh, to, to challenge a, a conviction, post-conviction, except under limited grounds. And I'm aware of another case that um, Rebecca Nagel uh, referenced, and that is uh, Barbary versus Whitten out of the Eastern District of Oklahoma that came with the, uh, the same holding. Uh, so basically, there are uh, probably only a few score cases that actually might be um, subject to retrial. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a, a flood of cases. Justice Corsuch in the questioning uh, seemed to indicate that there, he hadn't seen a, a flood of cases coming to the Supreme Court and uh, seemed to make that point. Uh, it's time for me to give you another code word. It's code word time, Sequoia. Your code word, second and final code word is Sequoia. So be sure to email your, your code word to Trish Archer or to, to uh, Kendall Bird uh, to get your CLE credit. Um, I want to address some of the other um, specters that um, the state um, threw up and, and also amici, um, local governments, oil companies, and, and other interests that, that express cons some concerns. Um, first is jurisdiction over non-Indians. Uh, if the Supreme Court decides tomorrow uh, that the Creek Nation is intact, non-Indians in Tulsa are still gonna own their, their homes on fee land. And you're not gonna see much of a, of, of a change in, uh, in, in your lifestyle. I think uh, the biggest change will be for hardened criminals who will face a different regime for uh, criminal jurisdiction. And there will be uh, increased uh, business in, uh, in federal court uh, under the Major Crimes Act and the Assimilated Crimes Act. And uh, tribal courts, of, of course, will have increased business and we'll probably need to hire more prosecutors and perhaps more light, light horse police and other police services, justice services. So um, I did wanna also point your attention to the, the uh, 
Cherokee Nation website, there's a, a really excellent two-page um, criminal jurisdiction chart. It's a federal criminal jurisdiction chart for Indian Country. The Arvo Mikkonen, the longtime assistant U.S. attorney from the Western District of Oklahoma, prepared. And it's a, it's a great chart that, that breaks it out by, by code provisions of uh, Indian on Indian crimes, victimless crimes, Indian on non-Indian, uh, non-Indian on Indian crimes, and, and how those shake out. It can get pretty complex, and, I, and frankly, I, I want to uh, express thanks to Patty Palmer and Gezi for helping uh, explain some of the in intricacies of uh, federal habeas and, and, and state criminal law. While I cut my teeth on, on federal criminal um, CJA Act, uh, Criminal Justice Act cases in federal court and tried some cases, it, it can be very uh, arcane and, and, and have some really um, technical uh, difficulties. So um, it's definitely a, an area of, uh, of expertise. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about uh, travel interests is uh, it will probably impact taxes, uh, the ability of tribes to tax and regulate uh, not only um, their citizens within the reservation, but potentially uh, non-Indians in certain circumstances. That's a big caveat though. Um, one thing I want to point out is uh, the presumption that tribes do not have civil adjudicatory jurisdiction or legislative jurisdiction over non-Indians in Indian country, absence, uh, uh, their consent, or limited circumstances of health, welfare, and safety under the uh, United States versus Montana uh, line of cases. That's a US Supreme Court case from uh, 1981 that dealt with the civil regulatory jurisdiction. There's also uh, the Oliphant case that says the tribes lack criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. And there was a Oliphant fix that ex expanded that to non-Indians, or I'm sorry, to uh, Indians uh, within Indian country. Um, but the other, the other case is um, Long Cattle Company versus uh, Plains Commerce Bank, which also um, further articulates the presumption of uh, no, no jurisdiction. So those cases uh, do provide protection to non-Indians and companies doing business in Indian country in many circumstances. But there will be a lot of uh, unresolved issues. And I can tell you that um, this is a wonderful time to practice in federal Indian law for all of us. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we will see a lot of interesting things. Uh, alcohol sales is a is an issue um, which could uh, come to the forefront under 18 United States Code Section 1160, and also talked about in the Parker case, um, alcohol can be regulated by tribes within the reservation. So that could present some issues uh, in the Muscogee Creek Reservation if it's uh, held to be in intact. But I think uh, as the tribe's amici brief, uh, the Choctaw and Chickasaw and former state officials uh, and the key brief and, and McGirt point out there's a strong interest in tribes and local and state governments working together to, to come up with cooperative agreements to resolve issues of mutual interest and those have been done on a number of uh, different issues and in, including taxation uh, cigarettes um, motor fuels car tags water. Uh, the, the Chickasaw Nation and Oklahoma City recently settled a, a long water rights battle, uh, you know, to, to work cooperatively on, on those issues. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, shared interests. Um, I'd like to, um, I, I realize that I've run long and I, I want to ask Trish, do you, do you want me to stop there? I could go on for another five or ten minutes about Specifically, what I saw from some of the justices and some uh, predi predictions of the court. I am all in favor of that. However, I have received a couple of questions, okay. and I do want to allow anyone who wants to attend the other seminar. And thank you for mentioning that. Um, 
And so I think if, if you have a couple of quick things you want to add, but if I could ask maybe these two specific questions quickly, okay. then, um, and then maybe you can finish up after that. And I'm going to go on here and read you these questions if that's okay. Absolutely. I apologize for running long. Oh, no, it's, I would let you keep going. I just, I like, so I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to hear as much information on this issue as they possibly can. So the first question I had, uh, Mr. McBride, is that how will the outcome of these two cases affect simple civil tort litigation? For instance, an auto negligence lawsuit between two Muscogee Creek Nation citizens where jurisdiction would otherwise be proper in Oklahoma state courts. Or a negligence case with a Muscogee Creek Nation citizen versus a non-citizen. I think in the, uh, the first instance, uh, um, the tribal court would clearly um, have jurisdiction to decide that, that case. Um, if it were a, a Creek citizen against a Creek citizen in state court, I, I guess there could be an argue, argument by one side or the other that the, the state lacks jurisdiction. But I, I think that that situation may still um, be subject to, uh, to state court. And, and that could be an open question there. I think that the situation of a Creek citizen that has an auto accident with a non-Indian, uh, I think that there would still be Montana and uh, Plains Commerce Bank issues in that case uh, that would probably militate it against uh, civil jurisdiction, against the non-Indian and tribal court. Um, but some of those questions are remain to be seen. What's going on watching, Hannah? Okay, and then let me get to this other quick question. Okay. It said, can the Supreme Court rule that the reservations was not properly disestablished, but then determined that it only applies prospectively? Well, that, that raises a lot of really interesting issues. And, and one uh, potential prediction uh, that was suggested by some of the justices and, and their questioning back and forth with the advocates is that the Supreme Court could rule um, that the Creek Nation is intact, but um, say we're going to give Congress some time to consider the situation and make our ruling effective post tense uh, for a period of time like they did in the Marathon case. Um, say give the Congress a few months to consider the situation. And under the plenary power uh, doctrine, uh, Indian Commerce Clause, Congress could, by a stroke of a pen, disestablish the reservation uh, again uh, by statute and uh, deal with it. But um, it, it does it does raise some interesting questions, and I haven't really thought through um, prospective application only. I mean, it it really could uh, raise some really serious uh, issues, uh, not only for the tribe but individuals in terms of liberty and property interests. Um, so I, I don't know the, the answer to that in terms of prospective. Okay, and I think I have one more here. So let me get on here. It says, did you say jurisdiction is waived by the 1996 Anti-Terrorism Act? And if so, how does that square with the fundamental notion that jurisdiction is never waived? The anti-terrorism statute uh, that amends the procedure for habeas corpus in federal court um, basically gives a one-year statute of limitations in most circumstances uh, that someone that's convicted uh, has only one year to make a challenge. It's a one-shot rule, basically. Um, there are limited exceptions to that. For example, if someone's actually innocent and like DNA comes up later, to, to prove innocence, then uh, that would be an exception to the Anti-Terrorism Act. Um, the precept that jurisdiction can be raised anytime is one in state law under the state constitution. And that has been the, the law with the Court of Criminal Appeals um, 
but the Court of Criminal Appeals could also craft uh, a potential latches argument, which would potentially run headlong into that, that issue. And that could present a constitutional issue that the Supreme Court would want to look at again. I think that there are so many issues that, that will be um, ripe for potential further litigation uh, as a result of uh, this case if, if the Creek Nation uh, reservation is found to be intact. And with that, Trish, I'll, I'll just make a, a couple of quick concluding uh, comments if I could. Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, I can tell you um, who, which justices do I think will decide what? It's pretty clear to me on, on several. Um, Justice Gorsuch, I think, uh, is a strict constructionist, a textualist. And I think that his questions uh, during the oral arguments clearly indicate that um, he believes that um, uh, the, the Creek Nation was not disestablished. Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan appear to have similar uh, leanings uh, by their, their questioning. Um, Justice Breyer seems to go in both directions and at the uh, he, he's pretty fond of asking these long uh, questions that could get a little convoluted, uh, hypotheticals. And at the McGirt oral arguments, he seemed to focus more on, is there a way that we could decide this on a, a narrow basis uh, to avoid um, a broad ruling that the Creek Nation reservation still exists? So Justice Breyer seems like an open question to me, and I don't know which way he's going to go. If you would ask me after the Murphy argument, I would have predicted that perhaps he would uh, side with uh, Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Gorsuch, and perhaps Justice Ginsburg, um, but I don't know. If, if it is that five, um, Justice Breyer would be the senior justice and he would have the, by, by custom, the um, assignment power of the opinion, and I would assume that he would probably assign it to Justice Gorsuch, but I don't know. That This is all speculation. We don't know how the Supreme Court's going to come down, and it, it could be, um, you know, uh, many different ways. Um, Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, and Justice Kavanaugh seem to be antagonistic to the uh, Creek Nation position, McGirt and Murphy, and Justice Kavanaugh in particular seemed to be very focused on practical outcome of uh, how will this impact things and, you know, a, a great concern about the potential flood of, of cases and, and convictions that, that could get overturned. So you could see a very broad ruling and uh, a potential for Congress stepping in and changing the law. You could see um, a narrow ruling uh, that would leave the, the whole reservation issue for another day, kick the can down the road, so to speak. Uh, if, there, if the Supreme Court rules against uh, McGirt and Murphy, they will have to come up with an Oklahoma exception to Nebraska versus Parker and Sullivan versus Bartlett. And I think that's a little bit difficult, but you know, Oklahoma is, has been kind of a unique circumstance. And the last thing that I would say is uh, there's a case called Osage Nation versus Irby. Um, Irby being the tax commissioner from about 2011 or so. And in that case, Osage Nation uh, challenged the jurisdiction of the state to um, uh, tax and regulate the Osage Nation. So, um, I think that that case may need to be looked at again if uh, if uh, the Supreme Court decides in favor of uh, Mr. Murphy and uh, Mr. McGirt. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, speak to you all. It's a great honor and privilege. And uh, thank you, Trish. And again, uh, the code words are um, Sequoia and sovereignty. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm very excited uh, on this new kind of an era.
for our bar association um, with hoping to keep this these web um, CLE uh, videos going on. Um, and again, a special thanks to Chief Hoskins for joining us today. Um, everyone from Cherokee Nation um, greatly appreciate all of your hard work and support of our bar. Um, we're hoping to move forward and do great things. So with that, um, I'll end this meeting unless anybody else has any more comments or any questions that they'd like to ask at this time. Thank you, Trish. Okay, thank you, Mr. McBride. Have a great day. And everybody also um, do join into the other um, seminar. Um, I expect that that's gonna be also one with a lot of um, great information. So thank you all and have a great day.